Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive, populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to creating a just society and ending corporate domination. Our guest today is James Russell. Uh, James is author of eight books, including Social Security, um, 401ks, and The Retirement Crisis. The book was in part based on a successful rank and file employee movement that he started uh, that allowed Connecticut state employees to transfer from 401ks like retirement plans to the state's pension plan. He advises employee groups that seek to make similar changes to their retirement plans. He currently teaches public policy at Portland State University and was recently named the national was recently named to the National Academy of Social Insurance. So welcome to the program, James. Thank you very much, yeah, David. Glad, glad, glad to have you here. So 401ks uh, and the retirement crisis. Talk about what the retirement crisis is. Well, quite simply, the retirement crisis is that more and more people are retiring without enough money to maintain their standard of living. And so they're going off their own personal uh, fiscal cliff when they retire. And a lot of what I believe is driving that is way back in the early 80s, employers began substituting 401k plans for traditional pensions. And at first, people believed that the 401ks would pay more than the pensions. But now that we've had a generation of workers retiring under them, we know it's quite the opposite. I would say people are getting far less than half uh, what they would have gotten under a traditional pension. And so that that's what is really the the retirement crisis. Uh -huh. Okay, all right. A and, and the difference between a 401k and a pension plan? Well, uh, the, the difference is that in a pension plan, it's a form of social insurance where you and your coworkers pay into one fund, and then out of that one fund comes the retirement benefits. And those benefits are guaranteed. Uh, there's a formula, the typical formula for the benefit is the number of years you've worked by some multiplier, say 2% of your salary, okay? Um, and, and that by your final salary. And so it's very predictable, the income that you'll get. With the 401k, it's really a savings and investment scheme where it's not collective at all. You as an individual uh, put money in an account and then you invest it in the stock market. You hope to build up enough money to then individually finance your retirement years. And that's part of the problem is that people can't build up enough money, okay? And then even if they do build up a tidy sum, they're not really very good things that they can do with that money to finance their retirement years. Mm -hmm. So it just does not work as, as predictably or as securely as the traditional pensions worked. Mm -hmm. These, uh, you, like he, here in, in Oregon, we have PERS mm -hmm. uh, and we hear stories constantly about how those are underfunded or in crisis or uh, appear that they're going to go under. So there seems to be, a, you know, there's just a lot of tension about that. Oh, absolutely. There's an enormous amount of tension. And a lot of that is intentional. Okay, that is uh, beginning in, again, the early 1980s, there's been a massive campaign by conservative uh, think tanks like the Cato Institute to undermine public confidence in traditional pensions. This is also related to Social Security because I think a lot of other people assume that Social Security is going broke. Well, none of that is true. Uh, yes, indeed, a pension plan can be underfunded, but the reason for that is not because it's too generous. It's because the employer let's say it's a public employer like PERS, the state of Oregon, over the years has been shorting the required contribution in order to balance its budget elsewhere. I mean, it's kind of like uh, if you 
in your mortgage payment on your house uh, start sending $100 less every month, um, that's going to catch up with you eventually, and then you're going to have this enormous accumulated debt. And that's, that's what the whole unfunded liability, uh, I, I hate to call it a crisis, because I believe it's a manufactured crisis. Mm -hmm. It's something that uh, any accountant can figure out how to, how to deal with. You just have to make up the back payments. Yeah, granted, that can be a sizable amount. The other thing to realize is that most states are not in that situation. I mean, you would think from a lot of the publicity that every last pension plan is, is underfunded, and, and they're simply not. Okay. Well, th this, is, this is interesting because the guest we had on last week was Robin Hanell, and he was talking about the tax uh, the taxes that corporations pay in Oregon, and uh, you know how 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 uh, we don't fund enough mm -hmm. uh, for all these social services, and in part because we don't collect enough corporate taxes, and so now you're presenting us with yet something else uh, that is underfunded for much the same reason. Well, not exactly. Not exactly. Um, uh, private corporations are not involved in the PERS system. True, true. Okay, it's the state of Oregon making uh, the payment. I mean, that could be an issue with private pensions, you know, the ones that still remain. But in terms of public pensions, it's uh, really a situation of legislatures, when they're doing the budget, deciding intentionally not to pay enough into the pension. A and a lot of the reasons why they do that is they can do that without creating any crisis. I mean, you can go for years of underfunding before you get to any point, because states are sort of for, forever. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, states can't go bankrupt. You know, so you can kind of push the debt higher and higher and higher. I don't think it's a good idea to do that, but it doesn't create an imminent crisis, and so they do it. And, and one of the ways that I look at it is that state employees are basically uh, making interest-free loans uh, to the state in order to balance the budget mm -hmm. and should be uh, considered heroes. Mm -hmm. But instead, <laughs> they're being whipped all over the places, mm -hmm. getting supposedly unrealistically high pensions that are gonna bankrupt the taxpayers and so forth. Yeah, so th this this is wh why, I, why I said what I said, that uh, it's, the fact that the corporations and wealthy in Oregon don't really pay their fair share. They mm. create this, this budget crisis, yeah. and then the yeah. money is taken, instead of going into the per system to fully fund it, uh, goes back to the state. Exactly. Uh, right. So, yeah. so it's indirectly. It's indirectly. Yes. Yeah, it's a right. part of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Very good point. Yeah, yeah. And do, do you, you don't think that state employees should uh, should have 401ks instead of pension pl plans? Absolutely not. I mean, unless they want to live le on less money in their retirement or they feel some moral obligation to support Wall Street. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because 401ks are, are essentially supporting the financial services industry, mm -hmm. which has mushroomed greatly since the 1980s in terms of its weight within the economy. I mean, I think, you know, in talking about corporations, that that's one of the real dynamics that a lot of people don't quite understand because it's hidden. But they have managed to get a hold of the collective retirement savings of a good part of working people and then use it to their own benefit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and their primary purpose is for their own benefit and not for, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they provide the, this service uh, as little as possible in order to do their primary objective, which is to benefit themselves. Correct. Um, I think one of the examples of that, which I think is a really revealing one, is if you look at Social Security. Social Security is essentially our national pension system. Okay, it operates as, as a traditional pension. The cost to run it in terms of the total administrative overhead, the salaries of the people, all of that, 
is less than 1% of the money that it brings in. There's no 401k plan that, that is able to do that for less than 20%. Mm -hmm. So that's a 20 wow. to 1 ratio. Mm -hmm. you know, so when you talk about, okay, if I put a dollar here or I put a dollar here, where is it going to render the most income? It's going to render the most in a traditional pension because the overhead is much, much mm -hmm. lower. Another way, look at this. Um, I mean, I don't know how many people who are viewing this uh, say read the New Yorker magazine but we can use any number of magazines. You'll notice all of the advertising that's in those magazines for getting a hold of your savings for retirement, okay, where there are promises that they will be good custodians, Charles Schwab, whoever it is, okay, and they'll show a picture of people walking on a beach. There always seems to be water in these ads <laughs> or canoeing in their uh, yeah, golden right. years. Uh -huh. okay, I mean, you get, get the picture. Where does the money come from, from to make those expensive advertisements? It comes from the savings that are being pulled into the 401ks. Contrast that with when was the last time you saw an advertisement for Social Security? I don't think I ever have. Never. No, never. never. It doesn't do that. No. You know, so, I mean, the money in Social Security is dedicated to paying the benefits. Mm -hmm. okay, and there are multiple. It's not just retirement benefits, there are other ones mm -hmm. that are in there. Okay, whereas these private things are, they've got so many, because they're competing with each other, and so they have to put a lot of money into advertising, but they get the money from, you know, the, the, the revenue from people mm -hmm. who are saving in those mm -hmm. accounts. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so it's really, it's a, a, a cost center for us and, and a benefit center, center for the operators, f well, for Wall Street. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I think the financial services industry has benefited enormously from 401ks and similar accounts mm -hmm. at the expense of working people who have had, you know, much less retirement security mm -hmm. than they otherwise would have had. Yeah. yeah. Talk about how successful Social Security has been as a retirement program. Well, it's, a, it's the federal government's most popular program, okay? And uh, it has been enormously successful. It could be a lot more successful, mind you, okay? But that's because it's not as big as it should be, okay? To bring it up to, say, European levels of a national pension fund. But even at that, if you look at just one statistic, if you look at um, the number of people who would be classified as poor, okay, who are over 65 years old, if there were no Social Security whatsoever, and it's around 42 percent mm -hmm. of that population, okay, the the actual number who are poor because you know when you bring in Social Security is under 10 percent. So it has reduced elderly poverty dramatically and succeeded very, very well mm -hmm. at doing it. In addition, Social Security also has a disability benefit to it. So if you get hurt or really sick in your working years so that you can no longer work, you have insurance against that so that you will you know, continue to get an income. It won't be as big as what you had before, but mm -hmm. it'll be something that's very important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so it's been a successful program mm -hmm. for lifting people out of poverty, right. uh, or not allowing them to get right, into right, poverty right. in the first place, right, yeah. Uh, it's going broke. Yeah, well, th that's another myth. Um, Social Security is set up uh, so that it has to be continually adjusted. Okay? It's like a traditional pension. You have money that's paid by employers and employees. That's everybody's FICA tax. Okay? That goes into it and then benefits come out of it mm -hmm. okay? into this big pot. Well, over the years, that has to be adjusted because okay, actuarials look at the size of the trust fund, look at, estimate how many people are going to be drawing on it, 
look at the revenue that's coming in, and then they can either reduce benefits or they can increase revenue, one or the other. Okay. In the past, it's been increasing revenue in one way or another. So, you know, here we are in 2017. Okay. Back in 1985, uh, there was something called the Greenspan Commission under the Reagan presidency, mm -hmm. okay, which attempted to fix the revenue. And they did. They raised it, you know, up to the 6.2 level that it's at for both employer and employee. Okay. But one thing they didn't foresee, it, and, and they couldn't have, I mean, it wasn't a fault, it was just that nobody could foresee it, was that between 1985 and 2017, inequality would soar mm -hmm. in the economy, lifting more and more income of the rich out of the reach of Social Security taxation. Mm -hmm. Because Social Security only taxes the first $127,200. Okay. Now, for me, for you, and I'm sure most people who are watching it, you know, we don't have incomes that are remotely close to that. Oh, right. okay? But when we're talking about the 1% and the rich, I mean, there, there are millions of dollars that is not taxed. So if you go back to 1985, you know, it was something like 90% of all, you know, salaries and wages were taxed. Okay, that has dropped okay, down to maybe 80% now. So that's driving part of the funding problems of Social Security. Very easily repaired. Yeah, tell us, tell us. <laughs> okay. It's called removing the cap. I mean, why should you only do the first 127,200? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't the rich have some obligation to support all the retired in this country? Why only tax income on wages? When you're really rich, most of your income is, on proper, is from property, or passive income, as mm -hmm. it's called. So why not tax that type of income? So there, there are plenty of ways to fix Social Security. And even if you didn't do that, you could raise it from 6.2 to 6.4, mm -hmm. okay, and that would solve the problem. Now, but there are people who don't want this problem solved, okay, and so what they want is for Social Security to really uh, drain out its funds, okay, and then to say, see, these systems don't work, you better start saving your money and 401k. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if nothing is done in 2034, Social Security will have to cut some of its benefits. It doesn't run out, okay, but it'll have to reduce them. There's no need for that, of course, from mm -hmm. any actuarial or financial point of view, but it's a political issue. Mm -hmm. So, so there are some good, good uh, reforms that we can make to Social Security that will both uh, potentially increase the benefits and certainly uh, solve any financial crisis that it might have. Oh, easily. Easily, yeah. Well, I say easily. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the <laughs> solutions are easy. The accomplishment of them uh, right, is not Right, it's a political right. uh, yeah, yes, problem. Uh, right, yeah, yeah. And, and so I, I, I think that uh, Speaker of the House Ryan has some plans Mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, Donald Trump, uh, our, our uh, uh, orange president, has some plans. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about what they have, uh, uh, what, what, they're, what they're thinking about? Sure. I mean, well, first, again, if I go back to the 1980s, okay, and the Cato Institute and other right-wing um, organizations who decided that Social Security was a bad idea, and they didn't like it uh, because the money was going through government um, funds rather than going through Wall Street, and so they wanted to, to end that. But they knew they had this problem in that it was so popular. Something like one out of every four or five households in the United States receives Social Security income. Mm. Okay, everybody watching this, if you're not drawing it, your parents did. Okay, so it's. Everybody has somebody in their family for whom this is very important, and, and they're thankful for it. Yeah, or, or you might have someone who's disabled. Or disabled. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there are multiple 
possibilities here. So many people are hooked into Social Security one way or another, not just in paying into it, but receiving benefits. So they had to, they thought, well, we have to convince people that it's going broke. And so that's when the campaign started, you know, and it just is very intentional to do that, you know, and so you have a lot of people who believe that it's going broke. Well, um, that, uh, I'm sorry, can you tell me a little more the direction of the question? Cause I got oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, here we <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was, I was asking about Paul Ryan. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Trump, okay, right? okay, yes. I got it, right, got it, yes. got it, got it. <laughs> okay, sorry, <laughs> sorry. We're no fun at tangent That's here. okay. <laughs> okay, well, with Paul Ryan and, and, and the others, I, I think one of the first things that people hear is we need to raise the retirement age to 70. Mm -hmm. Everybody should realize that that's basically just a cut in the benefits uh, because that means in your whole lifetime you will receive less benefits. Okay, and you, you, know, to, you have to work to 70. Okay. The one that's really scary, uh, which just came out last week, was really as a trial balloon in the Republican tax package, is that it would eliminate the FICA tax, which is what, that's funds, what funds it. Social Security. Mm -hmm. And it would instead have Social Security funded from general revenue. Oh, so Social Security would have to go to Congress or, or and the president and get get money allocated for it, right? Uh, which would probably be uh, diverted from that to funding the military, right? I mean, there would always be a reason why we can't afford it. Mm -hmm. Okay, back in in the, the time of of Roosevelt when it was set up in 1935. They intentionally set it up as something that employers and employees contributed to a fund. And Roosevelt, in interpreting that, said that that's so that no politician in the future could say that, you know, we can't afford this or, you know, or, or it depends upon what the budget will stand, et cetera, because this is a separate budget, mm -hmm. okay? It's a separate fund. Okay, and workers have rights to it because they've paid into it all of their lives. If you change it into general government revenue, it becomes a welfare program. Yeah. Okay, now, I personally am fine with the word welfare, okay, but in an American context, welfare is programs for the poor. Mm -hmm. okay, and there's a saying in Washington that, that programs for the poor have poor support meaning that it, the more that Social Security becomes a program that doesn't benefit the middle class and it's targeted for the poor, the more tempting it will be to cut back, cut back, mm -hmm. cut back. So I, yeah, I, I personally believe they're not gonna go very far with this mm -hmm. plan, okay, but that the fact that they're, very, that they're even raising it, okay, is, Social Security is always under attack has mm -hmm. been since the 1980s. Before the 1980s, it w there was a consensus among Republicans and Democrats that it was fine, mm -hmm. and they just kept supporting it. But it was this shift in the early 1980s that explains why it now has to be defended. Yeah, and, and as I recall, the 1980s saw uh, Reagan uh, assume the White House, right. and the Republicans get much, much stronger conservative right. um, control of our government, so uh, right. I, I want to draw that connection. Although there are certainly enough Democrats who, who buy those lines uh, as yes, well, that they can't, uh, they can't be let off the hook. That's right. I mean, there, there is a wing, a corporate wing of the Democratic Party that has gone along with um, the attempts to undermine Social Security. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that I, goes back to the Clinton years. Yes, right. And I, I would assume that if Paul Ryan and Donald Trump actually tried to move ahead with their program, that they would get the kind of turnout to their town, town hall meetings that they've been getting about Social Security, about Medicare. Oh yeah, I mean, you just have to go back to 2005 when uh, Bush uh, attempted to partially privatize Social Security. Uh, it started in uh, 
January of 2005, after he'd been reelected pretty handily, it was his top priority. He barnstormed the country trying to sell people on the idea. And the more he talked about it, the more opposed people came. And then by August, they had to drop it because mm -hmm. there was so much opposition. Mm -hmm. you know, okay, so yeah. I, I mean, there's, there's a reason why Social Security is called the third rail of politics. Yes, right. You touch it and you're going to have big problems. Uh, yeah, right, right. Well, we, we certainly hope so. The, the problem is that it gets touched in small, small areas rather than these large programs that uh, generate tremendous amount of opposition. But, you know, if you can make, well, number one, when you float an idea like the, like the Ryan and the Trump right. plan now, it starts to change the conversation. Yes. Uh, and and yes. moves it to the right. And so while you and I would like to have Congress talking about how you strengthen Social Security, uh, they do just the opposite. They move the conversation in the direction of how do we weaken it. Exactly. Right, yeah. Exactly. So, right, yeah. so okay. Uh, anything else that people should know about 401ks uh, that we have not covered? I'm sure there's lots, but. Um, well, uh, this book, um, when it, I originally um, started it, I had a different title. It was called The Perfect Swindle. Oh, I love it. <laughs> yeah, because it, I, I think that 401ks have been a huge institutional swindle. Mm -hmm. um, they started out promising people more retirement income, and they ended up producing not just less, but dramatically less retirement mm -hmm. income. If you go to Chile, uh, how are we time-wise? Yeah, yeah, actually we have a minute, so okay. yeah, I, okay. I, I, yeah, I, I sh should not have um, brought another topic up. So. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much for uh, being here, James. Thanks so much, David. Okay, great, good. So uh, we have been talking with James uh, Russell about his most recent book, which is Social Insecurity, 401ks and the Retirement Crisis. I uh, hope that you'll uh, grab a copy of it, uh, look at it, read it, understand it, and then act in your own interest. Uh, I hope you've had a, uh, I hope this has been an enjoyable program and that you'll visit us again. And I hope you'll have a progressive populist tomorrow. Thank you for watching. Bye.